All right, Warhawk, so we've got another uh, review. This review is over the Industrial Revolution, and uh, we're just going to hit the key points. That points. Uh, I will say, though, this is a, a particular unit of the um, – of just our whole course that is tested quite a bit. So I would pay close attention to this. Uh, make sure you are, uh, you know, going over not only this, but the uh, Quizlet that I'm going to put in there over the Industrial Revolution uh, and just really and any other uh, review games because this particular section, this particular unit over the Industrial Revolution, they do usually have uh, multiple questions. Uh, a year, um, sometimes like four or five questions. Uh, out of 50 questions, sometimes about four or five of them um, are over this. So that's, you know, uh, about 10% of the test sometimes, uh, which is pretty significant. Now, it's not always that, but uh, I'm looking at a couple years ago, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, eight questions actually one year was over, were over uh, from this particular unit. So a uh, very heavily tested unit. All right. Uh, so the Industrial Revolution. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, you might need that is sometimes talked about is that this idea that um, American manufacturing, so American manufacturing, you can see here, grows during the War of 1812. And it grows. You get more manufacturing because we can't trade. We're not trading with Great Britain during when we're at war with them. We're not getting our manufactured goods from them anymore. And so we must increase our manufacturing as a result of the War of 1812. Um, what is Industrial Revolution? So it's, uh, it's a time when machines uh, are invented to manufacture products. Uh, and so we use uh, water power, st uh, steam power once uh, coal and uh, the steam engine is invented and, and more effective. Um, and so we, what happens is it goes from cottage industry or from home production to factory production, so the factory system. So from the home or cottage to the factory, and that's the change that happens. One of the most important inventions uh, is the cotton gin. This is often a, a area that's tested. And the cotton gin uh, takes seeds out of the cotton fiber. Uh, it resulted in more cotton farms. Um, it helps to make cotton textiles. Um, very profitable uh, and ultimately leads to the growth of slavery. Um, you might think, well, why? If machines are starting to do this work, why would it lead to the growth of slavery? Well, it increases the demand for cotton because before it was so labor intensive and labor is expensive. Even, even if it's slave labor, labor is expensive. Um, you might think, well, why is slave labor expensive? Because it's still, it, it, talk, it takes time. If labor takes lots of time, that makes it more expensive, makes it more difficult, makes it not as efficient. Once the time is reduced, the labor is reduced, and therefore it is much cheaper. And so the cotton, the raw cotton was expensive because it was difficult to clean. With the cotton gin, it is cleaned more easily and therefore cotton is much cheaper. And that's one of the things that you're going to see is that with these inventions, like the cotton gin, interchangeable parts and things of that nature, you will see that prices go down, okay? Interchangeable parts is something that is necessary to lead to mass production. Uh, notice this says interchangeable parts started by Eli Whitney. It started in the United States by Eli Whitney. He's really a proponent of it. He's not the inventor of this idea of interchangeable parts, um, but he was a strong proponent of we. this is the kind of manufacturing we need to do. And so the purpose here of this image is the idea, if you can manufacture all these parts exactly identically the same, well, then if this breaks, I can just go get another one of these and put it on which is obvious to us. We go, if something breaks on uh, something of ours, on a car or something, we can just go buy another part. Well, that was not the case for back then. And it wasn't because they didn't have the idea. It's they didn't have the machining, the ability to make those things that precise. You would have to make something specific for each individual item to, because you couldn't make it, mass produce it precisely, exactly to close enough um, 
specifications that it would fit on just any one of these same types of weapons. And so you had to have a gunsmith manufacture it for each piece. Well, interchangeable parts, once you can get it to where they are interchangeable, one part for another part, you can switch them all out. Once you can do that, then you can begin mass production and prices go down because you can produce it. It's, it's cheaper to produce it that way. You don't have to do it one at a time. All right, so who in, invented interchangeable parts? Not really a great question. It shouldn't say invented. It should, who was a proponent or started interchangeable parts? That's Eli Whitney. He invented the cotton gin. Um, how does the interchangeable parts allow you to create more items faster? You can create the items, you can create individual items, many of those all at the same time, and then they can, then all of those different parts can be put together into many different weapons. You don't have to build one weapon at a time. I say weapons because this was first used with guns. All right, free enterprise. In America, we have free enterprise, which means we are allowed to buy, sell, and make whatever we want. America is also called a capitalist society because we can use our capital or money to make even more money. Okay, and so that's this idea of free enterprise where we don't have lots and lots of rules. There are rules, but there aren't lot. There aren't so many. We try to make it to where there's not so many rules for a business to where they can open up a business. You can start a business. You can buy and sell things um, without too many rules. Now, we certainly have far more rules today than we did uh, when our nation first began. Um, but we we work as a society, at least partially, to to keep from having too many rules on businesses so that they can produce goods in a, in a way that satisfies the needs of our society. All right. Uh, the group of men that are known as factory men, this is like Samuel Slater, Francis Cabot Lowell, uh, and they... Uh, they were the ones that would get the resources. They would gather the capital. They would have friends. They would get investors to build these factories because building a factory like this is not cheap. It's very expensive. And so you've got to get a lot of money together. Once you can do that, though, now you get all these this machinery and you can start to really build and make cloth or whatever it is that's going to be built and made in your factory. And you can do it on a larger scale and it's expensive to start but then each the cost per item begins to go down uh, and then essential to this is the people that worked in these factories and uh, during the industrial revolution we see women going to work in factories and children so primarily women and children actually go to work in factories in the early days of these factories um, partially because they could be paid less. At that time, it was acceptable, an, an acceptable idea to pay somebody less um, just because they were a woman or because they were a child. Uh, and so um, this work is done by many women in these mills. Uh, and in many cases, they were young women, and they may even live in dorms on the, on the campus uh, or on the, the same location as the work. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, we also have a major revolution to transportation. Canals are some of that fir those first uh, changes. And we can see right here, so we've got the er uh, Lake Erie, and a canal is basically built to connect Lake Erie to the Hudson River. And this, this might seem, well, that's not, how is that such a big deal? Well, all of this farmland, you can see, if, if you can get your goods to the Great Lakes, well, now you can get your goods to the East Coast all on water because water travel is far better than overland travel. Water, you can, you can load up ton, literally tons and tons and tons of goods in a ship and tra using wagons and horses to pull tons and tons of goods across the Appalachian Mountains is very expensive and difficult. And so the Erie Canal in particular, but it's not the only canal that's built, but it's the most famous one, and it's built. And now farmers in the West can get their goods to the, to the, the Great Lakes and across the Erie Canal 
to New York. And now you've got access to the entire East Coast or the rest of the world. Uh, if you're closer to the Ohio River uh, or some of these other rivers, well then, and the river is navigable, not every river is, is very navigable, but the Ohio and the Mississippi certainly are, you can get your farm goods to these rivers and then you'll go down this way. But farmers that are in this region, closer up here, that's not always easy. Uh, and some of these rivers that might think you could get to the Ohio River easy aren't necessarily very navigable. And so getting to the Great Lakes and then to the Erie Canal is going to make them a lot, make it much cheaper to transport their goods. Uh, the steamboat makes river travel even more efficient, uh, especially upriver. Getting downriver is not necessarily too difficult because the flow of the water is going that direction, so your travel is quite good. But going back upriver is not so easy. And so the steamboat makes that um, far more navigable and far better, far more efficient. Um, early steamboats were very uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, they may explode and cause all sorts of fires. Um, later, the steamboats improve and you don't have to worry about that as much. Um, and then the railroad comes along. Once you've got the steam engine and you can power a steam boat, well now you can build rails all across the country and send railroad, send trains all over. And a train can pull and carry lots of goods, tons and tons of goods as well. And it's a much easier to lay railroad tracks than it is to build a canal. And so the railroad ends the period, ends the real canal boom. There's still going to be canals uh, across the world that are built uh, in certain locations like uh, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, but that's not going to be for much later. These, But um, within the United States, you're not going to see a lot of canals being built once the railroad comes along because it's much cheaper to put rails and trains can haul tons and tons of materials as well. Uh, we also see the invention of the telegraph, which allows communication uh, across as anywhere you've built the telegraph lines, you can communicate between those two places almost instantly. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, the beginning of mass and quick communi instant communication. Uh, the phones that we have in our pockets or are really just an extension of this same idea that we can communicate across the continent and the world instantly. So telegraph and what is really the beginning of that and the beginning of, of, of even the internet itself. Uh, it's not the internet, it's the beginning of this. It's the beginning of this way of communicating that is instantaneous. Uh, urbanization, so this is the growth of cities. So if you think about it, there's all these things that are happening. You've got um, uh, farming equipment and that is making uh, farms more effective, so you may not need as many workers on a farm. You've got factories that are being built. You've got um, transportation that's happening, and so and you've got people now looking for jobs, women and children that are needing jobs, and so uh, you've got people moving to cities for factory work, and you're seeing the growth of cities. The vast majority of people before this time live on, in, in rural communities, small towns in, in the countryside, uh, well in excess of 90% in, in many cases of the population lived in rural settings. Well, once we see urbanization, we see a growth of big cities and that those numbers dwindle. Now, uh, there's still lots of people living in rural areas. Far more people live in rural areas at that time even in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, then live in cities. But we see the growth of cities. We really see cities becoming um, population centers with thousands and thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in some cases. We start to see cities that are growing over um, just the 20 or 30 or 40,000, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people um, moving to cities. And it won't be long till we start to see actually millions of people living within a city or near a city. All right, uh, and and helping to the with urbanization, uh, and helping with all these other things uh, is the growth of immigration. Uh, we see, uh, in particular, lots of Irish immigrants coming to the United States in the 1840s because of the potato famine in Ireland, uh, and they are primarily going to be working in factories. 
lots of working in factories and moving to cities, uh, but not just there. Uh, lots of Irish working on the Erie Canal. Um, other groups of immigrants that come, German come uh, because of there's there's turmoil in their homeland and their different uh, regions of, uh, of of what become the German nation. And then we also see the uh, we begin to see a lot of immigration from China and lots of Chinese immigrants coming to the United States, but they're not coming to the East Coast. They're going to be coming to the West Coast. We'll uh, coming to California first for gold and then uh, then working on the railroad. Uh, and it is primarily Chinese immigrants that build the, the, the Pacific, the uh, transcontinental railroad. So uh, immigration le helps to lead to the growth of transportation with uh, Erie, working on the Erie Canal, railroads, but we also see lots of urbanization as a result of this uh, immigration as well. Uh, we also see during this time the growth of sectionalism. So we see the North, the South, and the West, and they've got different um, opinions. So people in the North wanted a high tariff because that helped protect their goods. People in the South were against a tariff because they wanted uh, they didn't they wanted to be able to trade freely with Europe, uh, and the people in the West try to settle some of these disputes because they need they want uh, to be able to send their goods back to the East Coast. They they want this territory taken care of. They want uh, some of the things that the North wants and some of the things that the South wants, and so. Uh, we see uh, kind of a, a, a combination there. They don't all have the same um, desires. So the West, they are um, not looking for a high tariff necessarily. They, that's not important to them. But they do want infrastructure, uh, railroads and roads and things like that built, canals built. Uh, and that's something the North wants. The South doesn't need those things or want those things. And so they, because they know that how you pay for those is through tariffs. And so we see uh, a variety of different um, opinions here. The, the West often tends to push a little bit more for states' rights, and they were in favor of war with uh, Great Britain before the War of 1812. Uh, and so we see all these different which was similar to the South. So we see a lot of differences here between these three different regions. We're not going to go into the American system, and that's really so. That's going to kind of wrap up our um, review over the Industrial Revolution. That went a lot longer than I wanted it to, but like I said before, this was a uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of items here on the star test.